Good morning and welcome to the fifth in the series of retrospective conferences held by the John Howard Prime Ministerial Library. I'm David Lovell, Director of the Howard Library, and along with Andrew Blythe, the Library's Manager, whom you will see on the screen beside me, we'll be guiding you through the online sessions today. It's a pity that unlike our previous conferences, we can't meet in person. We well know that some of the important business, as well as the enjoyment of conferences, comes from the breaks, where delegates and presenters can talk informally and in many cases catch up. Today, while tea or coffee can be taken at any time, I'm afraid it will be taken alone. Nevertheless, I'm sure you'll be delighted by the range of speakers and topics connected to the coalition that we present today. Thank you, David, and good morning. I'm Andrew Blythe. The aim of this series of conferences is to deepen our understanding of the four Howard governments from 1996 to 2007, as well as to explore the lessons that may be drawn from them. As we know, the world has changed in the 15 years since Mr Howard left public office, but many of our contemporary political and policy challenges have their roots in the structures and decisions of the Howard years, if not earlier. Today, Apart from our conference, we mark a very significant anniversary, 25 years since the election of the Howard government in 1996. The University of New South Wales, which hosts the Howard Library, to begin its public events with an acknowledgement of country. UNSW Canberra wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the ACT, the Ngunnawal people. We acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of the city and this region. I also welcome our acting rector, Professor Harvinder Sidhu, to say a few words to you before we begin the substantive part of our day. Harvey. Good morning. My welcome to that given by David Lovell and Andrew Blythe. Among the many distinguished participants, I welcome in particular the Honorable John Howard, who continues to grace our retrospective conferences and to contribute as an elder statesman to Australian political life. UNSW Canberra is proud to be the host university for the John Howard Prime Ministerial Library. Established around two years ago at its premises in Old Parliament House, the library prior to the COVID pandemic had welcomed more than 10,000 visitors. But important as the exhibition is, the Howard Library's purpose is broader. It will preserve and make widely available the prime ministerial papers of John Howard, as well as Mr. Howard's other papers and those of various Howard government cabinet ministers. It will contribute to the development of public leadership and policy in Australia through conferences such as this, issues papers and podcasts, and support for university courses of study in public leadership and it will reach out to young people through its curriculum program to emphasize the importance of leadership in decision making. In all of these activities, the university linkage is vital. Politics is notoriously contested business and the university setting provides a non-partisan playing field where debates can be vigorous and critical, but also need to be respectful. We are fortunate indeed in being able to hear from many of the central players who were instrumental in the establishment and evolution of the Harvard government. The conference today and the published volume which will emerge from it will mark a step forward in focusing on this topic and will be a landmark for researchers to come. UNSW Canberra is proud to be a partner of these retrospective conferences and I congratulate all those involved in bringing today's event together. I wish you well for the conference and I thank you for your support of the Harvard Library. Enjoy your day. Thank you, Professor Sidhu. Before we turn to David Lovell setting the scene piece, let me briefly take you through a couple of important housekeeping issues. Of course, in this virtual environment, I no longer need to speak about the emergency exits or the location of the coffee cart. Rather, it's important to know that for most sessions, you, the delegates, have an opportunity to put questions to our presenters. This can be done by typing into the chat field that you'll see on your computer screens. Questions will be moderated by David Lovell and myself, and time allowing, we, we, we will put as many as possible to the presenter. 
Please indicate your name and affiliation so we can let the presenter know. Whether or not we have time to put all questions to the presenters, we'll certainly pass them on at the end of the conference so that they can benefit from your input when they come to write up their presentations for the conference book. Second, it's clear that you can walk away from your computer screen at any time during the day or even log out of the conference at your convenience. So please be aware that the conference is being recorded and if you miss any part and want to return to it later, it will be available on the Howard Library website by the end of the month. Third, all presentations will begin promptly at their scheduled time. At the end of every session, please remember to return to the main schedule screen and click into the next session. Finally, we want to give some words of thanks to the UNSW Canberra events team and CONSEC who have organised the mechanics of this virtual event and to the Howard Library's long-term supporter, Raytheon. We hope you enjoy the day. Professor Lovell will now set the scene for our discussions of the coalition. Good morning. The focus of this conference on the coalition is the first of the Howard Library's thematic rather than chronological treatments of the Howard governments. It draws attention to a feature that's sometimes taken for granted. And yet the Howard government's decisions were indisputably coalition decisions in which both Liberal and National parties had a voice and for which both were held accountable. Furthermore, the art of coalition governments in general, especially the coalition which in this case is so long standing, is a delicate and sometimes difficult balancing of policy, politics and personalities. We're fortunate today in having speakers who can draw on their experiences in and considered observations of the Howard Coalition and its successors. From an international perspective, Australia's coalition between the Liberal and National Parties is a small chapter in a very long account of coalition governments. But in the Australian political story, especially at federal level, it's a relationship that has shaped contemporary Australian politics. Whatever the details across this long-term coalition relationship, there are some overarching questions to which political commentators and strategists continue to return. Let me state them briefly. What is it that keeps these distinct parties together in opposition as well as in government without at least at the federal level merging? What are the core similarities and differences between the parties in terms of ideas and policies on the one hand and constituency appeal on the other? Is it merely a marriage of convenience as some seem to believe or is there a deeper commitment? Given its breadth of appeal and impressive electoral successes, how can the coalition be effectively countered by its parliamentary opponents? Is the coalition arrangement a clear benefit to both parties or to both equally? And of course, what is the future of the junior coalition partner, especially when there is a consistent demographic trend away from rural life in Australia? All these questions suggest a deep-seated, perhaps existential challenge for the nationals but no less a challenge for its coalition partner. As Mr. Howard himself has written, in the 1970s, even the hard-headed National Country Party Minister, Peter Nixon, recognised that the electoral arithmetic was moving inexorably against the Nationals. It still is. Without wishing to steal the thunder from our first two presenters, let me begin with a few words about the background to the Howard Coalition. A coalition arrangement was originally formed in the 1920s between the recently formed Country Party and the predecessors of the Liberal Party, linked by their anti-socialist philosophy and anti-labour politics. It is arguably the longest lasting coalition of its type in the world. To assist in its management, the various conventions have grown up around the allocation and number of portfolios held by the parties when in government. Before and during the Howard government and up to this day, for example, the leader of the National Party is the Deputy Prime Minister of a coalition government since that office was first gazetted in 1968 and first held by John McEwen. But earlier conventions about the allocation of the Treasury and trade portfolios have proved more malleable over time and have, as a consequence, become a bone of contention for fractious National Party MPs. By a stricter convention, ministries in a coalition government are still allocated in proportion to their relative parliamentary strengths. Here again, there are grumblings among some national MPs 
not so much about the numbers as their perception of the lack of importance of the ministries held by their party. One begins to appreciate that the coalition's durability and relative stability are not maintained without effort. Despite being a smaller partner, the nationals have played a sometimes decisive role in key coalition matters relating to both policy and leadership. After Harold Holt's death, for example, country party leader John McEwen initially vetoed Billy McMahon's ambition to become prime minister in late 1967. John Howard was a supporter of the coalition arrangement long before he became prime minister. His maiden speech to the House of Representatives in 1974 included comments on its value. It was clear that Mr. Howard's broad ideological commitment to individual freedom, dignity and initiative, which was evident in that speech, was and remains substantial common ground between Liberals and Nationals. There have been times when the coalition was under pressure from policy differences that mattered deeply to the National Party's constituencies. There continue to be such hot button issues, some of which come readily to mind. Water, trade, competition policy, fuel excise, communications, foreign ownership of agricultural land, and the mining of prime agricultural land. Disunity between the coalition partners was a factor in their defeat at the 1987 federal election under the strains of the Joe for Canberra campaign, of which we shall hear more later today. John Howard's coalition mindedness was a feature of his entire political career. At various times, he showed uncommon generosity towards the nationals, intervening at one point to prevent the Liberals contesting a three-cornered competition in the by-election that brought John Anderson into Parliament and urging a joint Senate ticket in Victoria after the 1987 federal election defeat. So it was that during his first term as Prime Minister, he invited the Nationals into the government despite the Liberals being able to govern in their own right. Rifts between the two parties when they're in opposition can be electorally, electorally fatal, as I've already noted, but rifts when they are in government can still be very serious. The Howard government's guns policy, for example, was an early test of the Howard coalition, yet it was supported by the Nationals' leadership ahead of their own immediate and perhaps long-term political gains. By contrast with the federal coalition experience, where the two parties are generally in tandem, the state scene has been dominated by mergers between them, though a merger with the Liberals at federal level was recommended by Peter Nixon in 1988 and again by John Anderson in 2007. I want to start wrapping up by highlighting three fundamental but intertwined challenges to the functioning and future of the coalition. First, the effects of demographics and economics, particularly as they impact the nationals. Second, the unintended consequences of coalition dynamics. And finally, the threats of being electorally outflanked that have been a feature of Australian politics during and since the Howard years. First, demographics. Australia's population is largely and increasingly urban, reaching over 86% in 2018. An associated trend is seen in the export statistics. Australian rural sector exports slid in value from over 42% to 12% in the 25 years from 1969 to 2014. Minerals and fuels now account for more than 50% of export value. Be the numbers as they may, rural and regional Australians feel themselves as distinct and generally disadvantaged by comparison with their urban cousins. They look to their parliamentary representatives to stand up for them and for a way of life that, however diminished, continues to shape popular notions of an Australian identity. They remain a constituency to be reckoned with. The National Party vote in the House of Representatives was at a high point in the Howard government's first election in 1996, when it reached over 8%, but declined into the 5% range in subsequent elections. Across the Howard government's, national seats in the House declined by almost half. Nor do the nationals have a mortgage on rural and regional electorates or on Australia's poorest electorates. Tom Frame, my predecessor as director of the Howard Library, has put the point bluntly. The Nationals, despite their name, are in danger, he said, of descending into a political rump preoccupied with special pleading for marginalised voters. 
Let's move on to coalition dynamics. Being a junior partner in governments that have held power nationally for 49 of the last 71 years, paradoxically brings with it substantial challenges. In particular, while nationals can point to many significant policy outcomes that have addressed the needs of their stakeholders, they are constantly in danger of the electorate considering these benefits as due to the Liberals. Mr Howard's very dominance of the political landscape through his extended term as Prime Minister added to this effect, despite the Nationals' high profile leaders. Paul Davey, from whom we will hear later, argues that the National Party was not underperforming, but it was either or both being overshadowed by the senior coalition partner or undersold by its own parliamentarians. Coalition had become almost synonymous with Liberal, a point John Anderson reflected when he said in effect that John Howard almost killed the Nationals with kindness. Nationals today are understandably keen to remind those of their presence. And thirdly, electoral outflanking. In a democracy, pragmatism and compromise are the order of the day. Consequently, a recurrent nightmare of any party that's serious about holding government is being outflanked by rivals who capture parts of its base with appeals to ideological purity but with no prospect of actually making hard decisions. Labor has its own problems, which I don't propose to discuss here. On the non-Labor side, the threats are from a more conservative politics, centered on issues such as multiculturalism and immigration, indigenous disadvantage, environmentalism and climate change, republicanism and gay marriage, attempting to outflank the small L liberal and small C conservative elements that are mixed throughout the liberal and national parties. The Nationals are further assailed by locally prominent independents and minor parties that trade on larger than life personalities, though whether those parties will like survive the likely flame outs of their founders is doubtful. In New South Wales, but so far not at federal level, the Nationals face a real challenge in their rural heartland from the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party, a group which emerged in opposition to the Howard government's National Firearms Agreement and was critical of the Nationals' perceived acquiescence in it. Such non-Labour challenges to the coalition might best be described as populists, attracting votes by denouncing ordinary politics as ineffectual and corrupted, and offering simplistic solutions to complex problems that often target outsiders as the root of all their troubles. Populism seems to have become a fixture of contemporary Australian politics as elsewhere. Mr. Howard has rightly said that all modern political parties are coalitions. The challenge, he went on to say, is to keep the different elements of the coalition together. So much of the challenge, in my view, is about managing people, their expectations, their ambitions, and their egos. The coalition's durability belies the delicate managing required for its maintenance and strengthening. Of course, there are important incentives. The coalition provides the nationals with an influence in government decision-making out of all proportion to their electoral support. And it provides the liberals with access to a significant constituency they might otherwise struggle to reach. Yet the partnership restricts the nationals ability to present a distinct identity when any public discussion of differences is interpreted by political opponents gleefully as a sign of the coalition's disintegration. For all the successes of the Howard governments, the Nationals might nevertheless be justified in feeling they got the worst part of the deal. Yet while attempting to differentiate their product around colourful personalities or hot button issues may provide short term breathing space and satisfy some personal ambitions, it is not a long term solution. In this regard, we might note that thoughtful and articulate parliamentarians cooling their heels on the backbench are always potentially troublesome for the party or parties in government. Not bound by the conventions of cabinet solidarity or confidentiality, they can promote their nostrums with relative impunity. Throw ambition into the mix, and such backbenchers will pick at the scabs of government decisions to advance their personal agenda. Above all, the coalition relationship cannot be taken for granted. The Liberals must give and be seen to give appropriate recognition to Nationals' contributions. The Nationals must find a distinctive voice which is complementary to, not destructive of, the coalition. Differences are inevitable and their settlement generally productive. 
Whether and how disagreements are played out in the public arena, however, should be an exercise in restraint, best done by cool heads. The Howard government's exemplified a strong coalition at work, pragmatically blending common purpose and rivalry, but the work of jointly building a coherent account of the national interest is never complete. I look forward to hearing what our participants have to say about these and related issues today. Delegates, um, the next session, which covers the evolution of the coalition, uh, will begin in a moment. Please go back to the conference homepage, which is the timeline for the day, and click to enter the presentation given by Paul Davey. Thank you.